1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. I'd like to read this. I provided it for you on the slide. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. It's very short. And I hope that you can just really ponder just the depth of this. Paul is teaching us um, so many wonderful things in this. Uh, talking about even how we ought to be servants and uh, uses Israel as an example, and he's going to talk about proper worship and communion, even get into the Lord's Supper, diversities of gifts. There's a lot that he's dealing with. He makes this statement kind of in the middle of all these things. I think it's very, very important. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Whatsoever therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, and that kind of becomes all-encompassing, do all to the glory of God. Lord bless you. You can be seated. All right, I made, uh, I'll mention this now, I made two statements or did two things on Sunday that I think have had people a little bit perplexed. The last thing I did is I, in, in praying at the end of service, I entered into what is called intercessory prayer, and I had at least a half a dozen people ask me if everything was okay afterwards, and uh, just because of what I was praying. And so I think I'm fine, but sometimes the Spirit gives utterance to things that we don't know, but it was just a feeling that came on me. As I began to pray, and I felt that I was praying for somebody else. We talked about a decision, a crossroads, or being at a decision, or being in a cycle that someone feels that they can't break out of. That was just me opening up my heart and beginning to pray. So I always, I was happy to know that many people were praying for me. I thought I had that going for me, but I wouldn't want you to be worried that somehow everything's falling apart, and uh, I was losing, having a crisis there at the end of service. Having said that, the other thing I did is I just showed a graphic, and it was Kids Eat Free on Wednesdays. And I'm not even going to explain it tonight. You're just going to have to ponder it. But kids eat free. And tonight, I noticed that the slide didn't save right, and I spent way too much time trying to figure that out. But my title tonight, uh, I first, I want to let me put it this way. I want to start a new segment. It being a segment, it's not necessarily a series. So it doesn't mean we'll pick it up on Sunday or even next Wednesday. Just be a segment we get to every once in a while called Kids Eat Free. You can just ponder that, chew on it a little bit, pun intended. And uh, you get what you expect. So if you're expecting a kid's meal... If you have enough faith, maybe you'll get one, But uh, in the natural, that is. But this will be the first installment uh, in this segment of Kids Eat Free. I like to do it on Wednesday nights as the Lord would lead, and the title, the subject I wanted to explore tonight is Digging for Gold. And uh, you could show the next slide, Brother John, we'll just use this as our, our la launching point. And this subject matter, Digging for Gold, I want to use this kind of what has been burdening me is last November that the Lord put this on my heart and began to explore it, is that there's a, hidden, there's a hidden glory of the family. There's ways that we look at the family, think about the family, and we see certain things that are maybe important or necessary. Uh, even family can be a hot-button topic uh, politically in different ways, but there's a hidden glory of the family that I want to explore. And so my proposition tonight is that children are the glory of the family. So I'm, just, I'm proposing that to you, that children are the glory of the family, and it being a proposition, you can make up your mind and your hearts just exactly what that means, or even if that's true. But I would say that children are the family's gold. It's a treasure of the family, it's something very precious. And the, uh, the limit that I'd want to place on that, or something to take into consideration so that you don't take it too far outside of its bounds, or the caveat as we have it listed here, is this is, a, this is not the basis for par uh, parenting from the point of pride or selfishness to where we think, well, we want to do everything vicariously through our children, or we're constantly trying to force our children. When we talked last year about no filter, I think that was something that we emphasized quite a bit, is that we don't want our children to live, a life, uh, in, live life in such a way to we feel it reflects good on us as parents. What we should want is the best for our children, and in desiring that, know that at the end of the day, that's what's going to give us the greatest satisfaction. The Bible says we, there's no greater joy than to see our children walking in truth. And, and children walking in truth may not give you the political or social clout that you want, even within a church, right? So it's not, it's not this acceptance or feeling important and not that kind of gold where everybody thinks you're rich, but it's in a real true way. So the, the, the disclaimer on that is we're not, not mentioning children as being gold and the digging for gold and something selfish that you want to get out of your children. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I can still remember 
uh, one of the first times I remember a minister really breaking this down, it was Brother Tom, Brother Tom Ray ministering on it and expounding upon uh, what this meant. And to train up a child in the way he should go, it uh, leaves, it's a principle maybe that begs a lot of questioning. Like, well, what does that mean? What is the way that he should go? But then it gives this principle, and when he is old, he will not easily depart from it. This is something that has a guiding power upon the child, and it's a principle that we've, we've all heard this before, right? I mean, this is a scripture that parents really, really hold on to. Maybe as children, you go, yeah, yeah, I've heard it. But one day if the Lord tarries, you'll be, yeah, yeah, I believe it, because it'll mean more to you. But the way he should go, even this phrase, train up a child, I think that has a, a particular meaning and emphasis that we can amplify. In the way he should go, that phrase is often misunderstood. Because we think, uh, train up a child, and this is the way we probably process in the way that we think he should go. Train up a child in, in what we think he ought to do. But even the way the wording is used in the Hebrew, it's not our way, but train up a child in his way. So there's a, there's a sensitivity and understanding even that there's a way that we want to train up a child to where we're training him up and raising him up. I just want to be sure that I, I'm going to be coming back to this scripture, and I want to be sure that I... I leave it right where I want it to be, that there's a way that we train up the child that's peculiar to that child, but and not necessarily our opinion or what we would desire. I could have the desire as a father, say, well, I have a, I have a law practice that I could pass down to my sons. And sons, you need to be lawyers. This is a tremendous opportunity for you. And that could be my desire, but there has to be a sensitivity that to train him up in the way that he should go, that's different from the desire I might have naturally to see my son accomplish something. And, and that's where I think maybe we, we address that caveat. This is nothing selfish from the point of parenting or any kind of negative pride or bad pride. Now, this may seem to be kind of a, a huge leap from that, but now that we've kind of established that kids eat free, and tonight we're preaching about digging for gold, and we've established that. In Mark chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God. This fits in very well. These next several moments will fit in very well with the subject matter we opened up on Sunday on I Am, an open book. Now, I want to explore the things about Jesus Christ, and so maybe this is just helping me a little bit by sharing some of these things now. But Mark writes it this way, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, describing Him as we all believe, the Son of God. We realize we use the language. Let's ponder a little bit more deeply tonight. Jesus Christ was or is the Son of God. And the Bible, clearly and over and over again, and Jesus himself using this language quite often of expressing this relationship of the Father and the Son. And the New Testament, it constantly expresses it this way. And this is a dynamic that's very unique to the New Testament because the, the children of Israel viewed Abraham as their father and the God they worshipped as the God of their fathers. And now Jesus begins to use a language that's very unique, and he's saying, here, here am I as what you believe to be a mortal man who has a relationship to God, the God of Abraham. I have a relationship to him as a son, which is not even a relationship that Abraham shared. And so for God to choose, and I, and I want you to recognize this is God's desire, for God to choose this exact expression of the Messiah and, and Savior, since those are two distinct offices, to the expression, I say offices, the Jews believe in a Messiah or an anointed one. The concept of a Savior wasn't, ex wasn't exactly very clear to them. But for God to choose the expression of sonship in the Messiah and the Savior was very unexpected. And we looked at this on Sunday in John chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. It says, But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. He's doing something on a Sabbath. This is against the law. This is worthy of stoning. And he says, My Father works, so I work. And this is Jesus now. They knew exactly what he was saying. When he said, my father, they didn't go, well, Joseph's not here. He doesn't work on Saturdays. They knew he was talking about God, the I am. So therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father. And this is, what was in, this is clearly what is understood by the Jews when Jesus says that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So this is, there's a, there was a reverence, an honor, a, a pride, a, a treasure embodied in a father-son relationship, a parent to child to the Jews. And so when he said that the, the God, Elohim, Jehovah was his father, that they immediately begin to relate to how important that would have been in their law and in their history and their structure. Think of, they're, they're called the children of Israel. Just think how tightly they were bound to familiar relationship and bloodline. 
Like none of us call ourselves children of the name of our great, 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 great grandpa, right? We, don't, we just don't do it. And so, but to them, they were identified and measured by these relationships and by their fathers, the God of our fathers, the God of our fathers. And to a Jew, when he says that he refers to the father, my father works here too, and the son works here. To a Jew, even the word son, which would be ben, it means, it comes from the word bena, which means to build or continue. And this, so this is what even the word son kind of assumes. We think son, and we immediately just think, oh, it's just a child of a, of a parent. It's a son is the male offspring of a mom. A son is the male offspring of a father. But it meant more for this, in this word son, which we've been, it's the builder of the family name. And for this, the word that's used that was attached to the son initially is the son is the multiplication of the father. And that's what God intended in the beginning. That's why he gave the woman to the man was to multiply the man. So a son is a duplication or a multiplication of the father. And so in the scripture, you could have Ben, ben Onai or Ben-Hadad, and it's the son of. It could be written away, son of my sorrow, the, the son of Hadad. And so Ben is the son of. So if you think of being, to use even the name Benjamin, it's to denote that this is something that comes from the parent. So it's always related to the parent. In the New Testament, Simon Barjona. What is that? Simon, son of Jonah. So he actually is identified by his father in his name. Because that's what a son represents. He represents uh, uh, the father. He, he's a multiplication of the father. To the point to where now he says, my father works and I work. And they immediately say, well, then if you're saying that God is your father, you've made yourself equal to God because that's what a son is. That's his position. His calling is to ultimately assume that place as the family, the builder and the progenitor of the family name and even the legacy then of that name. So it's upon this basis that Jesus declared the father. I come in my father's name. Multiple times he references the father. And as the son... He manifests the Father's glory. This is what is mentioned quite often in the Scripture. In John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. No other man could claim that title at that time as being the only one that God has fathered. The only man born of a woman that came from God, came from the process of the word of God, forming itself in the womb of a virgin and being brought forth as the only begotten son of God. And now the word made flesh in Jesus Christ, they're beholding his glory, but not just the glory of Jesus, the son of Joseph in the natural or Jesus, the man of Galilee, but the glory of the father is expressed in him. And if that's not clear, you could see how Paul brings it back in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So where is the knowledge of the glory of God? In the face of Jesus Christ. It is the face of Jesus Christ that we behold that declares to us and manifests to us the glory of God. This is a familiar refrain to a Jew because they, they knew that when Moses had met God on the mountaintop, his face shone, was shining with this glow, with this countenance, having met the glory of God, and they had to veil his face. Well, that which was symbolized and represented in Moses is made perfect in Christ that it's through Jesus Christ you know the, the glory of God. The light, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God on the face of Jesus Christ. Why? The Son is the glory of the Father. Christ is the manifestation of the glory of God. As His image, as His expression. Philip said, show us the Father and it suffice. He says, have I been so long with you that you don't know who I am? When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now we realize that in the literal sense... If we tried to kind of get very literal on that uh, uh, and, and try to make it in a literal sense, we realize that he's saying that whatever God is in the invisible sense, as this Elohim, this invisible God, he is now tangible. He's now expressed in me. This, there's a, there's a, a glory of God that's being expressed. Hebrews 1, 2, and 3. And I know I'm taking some time to do this, but I think these are important things to be very fresh in our minds. He says, 
hath in these, God hath uh, by past times spoken by the prophets, but hath in these last days spoken us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory in the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. All these scriptures are showing us that Jesus, as the Son of God, was declaring the glory of God. His grandeur, His majesty, His character, His attributes. What He is, you could know through Jesus Christ. And this is then, it's a very important relationship that God wants to establish. Because again, just kind of backing up, in one sense, the Messiah could come as a natural man and, and come as one who is born of a woman. But yet, according to all these different prophecies, and, and the Jews would have received a man of that, of that caliber, of that stature. And there's ones that the Jews believed that lived natural lives and, and led the people and did certain things that were very, very close to what a Messiah should have been, but yet didn't fully fulfill all the prophecies. And they believed that those natural men were more, like, more of a Messiah than Christ was, whom we believe to have come straight from God. Because they don't, they don't see it that way. But God wanted it to be a man. He wanted it to be, well, if we could say, a son of man. But he, wa- he wanted to establish a relationship between himself, the, 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 the deity, the divine, and humanity. He wanted to establish a relationship so that through that we could begin to understand ourselves and understand the relationship that he wants us to have with God. So the Son manifested and declared the Father's glory. We could say the Son of Man was the glory of God. The only way that God could truly be made flesh is in His Son. Brother Branham, in the message, Christ is the mystery God revealed. He says, but what He wanted to do, He loved fatherhood, for He was a father. This is an essential characteristic of God. He is a father. Parenthood originated in God, Brother Branham says. And so He loved parenthood, He loved fatherhood, He was a father, but the only way He could express it, the only way He could express fatherhood was to become a son of man. So if God is going to be a father, he had to become a son. If God is going to be a husband, he has to become a bride. Right? We understand these principles. So consider this principle, this father-son relationship, and what it expresses for us. If there's a principle, if there's a reflection, if there's something that God wants us to gather from it, let's ponder this. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Now, there's a commandment that we ought to follow God as children would follow their fathers. A child inherits its nature from its parents. And I think it's very obvious, and having got through maybe the foundation part, I don't know if I'm going to slow down a little bit. I just felt like I have to get that part in, and maybe I'm very preachy tonight. But a child inherits its nature from its parents. So without any effort, it imitates. It doesn't even have to try. You say, well, there's certain instincts they have in them that are just inherent in them. They've inherited them. They're in their their DNA. It's in their genetics. And so without any effort, they can mimic their parents. A son will mimic the father. A daughter will mimic the mom. And there'll be certain attributes and traits that children exhibit. And like, oh, that's just like their dad. Or that's just like their mom. Or that's just like me. Or that's just like you. It's in them by nature. Now, that, that can... It probably scares a lot of us, right? Like, oh no, because when you're born again, by the new birth, you receive a new nature. But for some reason, God did not allow the new nature to pass genetically. Whenever you have children, it follows your old nature, unfortunately. So think about this. You're born in sin. You're shaped in iniquity. You know the life you live to the point that you got born again. But you get born again. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. And then you get married and you have children because that's the proper order. And then now having children, you realize, oh, no, they've got the nature I had before I was married, before I had the Holy Ghost. And then you realize that parenthood has a great, the greatest power to influence and to shape the character of a child. The single greatest power. I know that there's a certain, uh, I know there's even a Chinese proverb that men resemble their times more than their parents, but we're not Chinese. And there's, uh, there's certain ideas that could be expressed that the children can be reflective of their generation and their school peers and things. And, and that's if you let it. That's if you let it. But there's really no better way for a child to be influenced than by his parents. And true parenthood is a calling. 
It is an office. Think of how, and we're just maybe touch on it very quickly, like God entrusted His own Son to the care of parents. So I'm going to send a Savior. I'm going to send the Messiah. I'm going to send Him into the world. He's going to be me replicated. He's going to be bone of my bone. He's going to be flesh of my flesh. He's going to have my spirit without measure. I'm going to pour myself into Him. But I'm going to, from birth, entrust Him to a father and a mother. And this is God wanting to reflect something very powerful to us. So if we are parents, then this responsibility matters. And I would say it's a responsibility that never ceases. Because it may be very easy for some to say, well, at this point, Brother Aaron's talking about families, talking about raising families, my children are grown up, then, uh, it, it, then that doesn't apply to me. But really, when do, you, when do you cease to become a parent? You know, by divorce, you can cease to be a spouse. But you'll never stop being a parent even when the child dies. Did it just get serious all of a sudden? Ask anybody who's ever lost a child. It's not like, oh, well, they died, so I'm not a mom anymore. No, they'll carry it with them as a mom their entire lives. Why? Because there's something so powerful about this office. This responsibility matters so, so tremendously. And our manner of life in this calling, how we conduct ourselves in this calling is of utmost importance. In the message, Elisha, the prophet, Brother Bram says, and how can you expect your children to go to Sunday school and serve the Lord when you yourself don't even go? That's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? And so Brother Bram says you shouldn't send your kids to Sunday school, right? You've heard that? Brother Bram said you shouldn't send your kids to Sunday school. He said you should take them. And he's touching on this attitude where maybe you're expecting things of your children that they ought to do but how can you expect them to go to Sunday school when you don't even go yourself? Right? They're, they're, uh, they, I want them to be faithful. I want them to be persevered. I want them to be church-going people. I want them to honor the Lord. I want them to do this and to do that. And he said, how could you expect them to do it if you don't do it yourself? And he says this, how can you expect your children to be something when you're nothing? Ah, ah. That's a heavy statement. So then he, he recognizes the heaviness. I don't mean you wasn't nothing. But I mean, when you know that you make no profession, when you know you're not, this is Brother Aaron talking now, when you know you're not doing something, how can you expect your children to be that something? Hey, I, I'm going to step on everyone's toes, but it's kind of like, will you stop yelling? Right? How do you expect them to stop yelling if that's all you do? They're like, okay, yes, mom. It, it, there's a certain thing that's been reflected in conduct that children are naturally going to turn back around to you. And he said, how can you expect something from them when you're not doing something yourself? How can you expect your children to be righteous when you're putting such an example before them? How can you do it? You're the best example that they have. They're going to look to you when they won't look for no one else because your nature is in them. The example matters. It's the example that in, in a, lot of, a lot of ways, if you could, and I, I have to just really rely on the Holy Spirit to maybe deal with your hearts on, on a, to a deeper level. But our parents took us to church, took us to meetings, put the word first, sacrificed for years, and then we have an experience with God. We get the Holy Ghost, and then we start, we start doing those things by nature now, by a new nature that our parents tried to demonstrate and express to us beforehand. And let's not forget the positive things that were done that led to the place to where we could receive a baptism of the Holy Ghost and go forward. Because if we're, not, if we're not doing, if we don't do even the things our parents did, then how can we expect better results? All right. To those on the radio, the people are shaking their heads up and down vigorously. To those who are tuning in by phone hookup. And you can't see the, the vigorous nods. But the, the people are agreeing. Think about that, how humbling that can be. That if a prior generation had it so hard and, and they, met that, they met that difficulty with a certain intensity... And then this generation has it harder, and we're not even meeting the intensity of the prior generation. There's a tremendous imbalance that begins to take place. Something to consider. So they, 
the, the children are to be followers. We are told to be followers of God as dear children. What I want you to recognize then is that God, Paul is referencing, and even uses it later, follow me as I follow God. So that kind of is the right example. That if I'm your father in the gospel and I'm following the right thing, there's no detriment in you following me. Right? If the, it's the blind leaders of the blind, or they all fall in the ditch. But if you're following an enlightened leader, if you're following one who knows the way and someone who knows the truth, then even if you're blind, the, the, in the following, you could come to the light. You could come to sight because the, the disciple would be as the master. So there's this dynamic of then children then being predispositioned to mimic and imitate their parents. That's a sobering thought. And if they have your nature to begin with, then they'd be better served by a different nurture, right? If, if, if my sons have Aaron McGeary's nature by birth, then what I would want to do is nurture them in the Lord, not in more Aaron. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7, as I was kind of amplifying how the Son, Christ, was the manifestation of the Father's glory, now think about this scripture. For, indeed, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, and the woman is the glory of the man. Now this is a, a, a familiar scripture. But I'm just going to walk through it. The man is the image and glory of God. So the man reflects the glory, the majesty, the excellence of God. We can say in his original state, man in his original state represented God's glory, represented God's perfection. That's what he was to be on earth as a God, having dominion and power. This was all reflected in the office of manhood when God made man. And therefore, manhood retains this image even still now. As we talked about it last Wednesday, God is the good. That there's still an element of deity in the divine, a shadow that still shocks mankind to this day. And it's when someone does really good, it shocks us, right? Because that, if there's good, it, that has to be God. That has to be something divine. And so man, even still today, holds an office or a position that is reflective of God's nature. It's the place that God has put him in the scripture and where, what, the office that he holds. Now, as the Bible is saying, the man is in the image of God, it says, but the woman is the glory of the man. So likewise, the woman is intended to be an expression of man's glory. That the man coming from God and being in the image of God is reflective of God's glory. Now the woman coming from the man, she becomes a reflection of the man's glory. But remember, kind of the order, uh, the order of that ascending, she is now an expression of man's glory. She's a reflection of his majesty, his honor, because she's come from the man. And, and I don't, I'd love to maybe express this and amplify this to greater detail, but the woman represents a man's character. If she is the woman who has come out from the man, or she's the woman that is joined to the man, she represents his judgment, his opinion. The woman is, if I can say that, she is the opinion of the man. Now, that means that if, and we're looking at a man and a woman as man and wife in that relationship. The man is in the image of God, and therefore he represents the glory of the Father. But now, in the marriage, the woman represents and is expressive of the glory of the man because she reflects his opinion. She is his opinion. So he's saying, uh, he, his opinion of this woman is that she's worthy to be a wife. She's beautiful. She's someone that I have, I want to have. So she represents his opinion. But then also others can look at the woman and by looking at the woman derive some assessment about the man. I don't know if I shared this with you, but uh, last election cycle, when I was getting some quotes from very close friends of mine saying that they believe that Kamala Harris fulfilled the prophecy of this woman rising up to power in the United States, and kind of just jokingly, because I, I said, well, the only thing that tells me is you think she's beautiful. I, and, and that was their opinion of her. And I didn't hear from them for a while, so I had to text back and say, hey, hey. I was kind of joking. Uh, but the, uh, it's, it, it's reflective of his opinion, a man's opinion, that if this is, he believes that she is a quality woman to marry she says something about what he desires and what his expectations are. And if you looked at her and said, she has no desire to have children, she has no desire to keep home, or she has no desire to be a Christian, she has no desire to act uh, 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 with integrity or honesty, then you would say, that man, it must not matter to him. It must not have mattered to him at all to marry a woman that would be a compliment. 
The Bible says in Proverbs 12.4, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. She is the coronation of his office, the coronation of his title. She is a crown to her husband. That, to think of it, the crowning moment for a man is this woman that he marries. But she that maketh ashamed is rottenness in his bones. Now why? Why would she be rottenness in his bones? It's only the power to corrupt is only as great as it is because of the power she has to crown. If she had no power to corrupt, there'd be no crown. But because a, a, a woman that makes a shame is rottenness in his bones, the, fa- the fact that she has power to corrupt, by the reverse, she has power to crown. And we're familiar with this principle in choosing of a bride. There's a lot of statements that fit this. The kind of a woman that a man would choose will reflect his ambition and his character. And the kind of man that a woman, uh, that a woman is chosen by man, and when a man chooses a woman, that, ma- that woman that sh- he chooses reflects something about what's on the inside of him. As we expressed it before, there's something hidden about the man that's not revealed until he chooses a wife. There's a, this is, uh, well, there, there's things that begin to rush into my heart that I'm thinking about even personally. But there might be things that you recognize and you see, and you may, you could speculate at. Say, well, I'm not sure, I don't know. But then the choosing of a wife reveals a lot. And Brother Bram even says that, a man, that when a man chooses a wife, it says something about his future home and what he wants his home to be. Even though it does not yet exist, it reveals the character of his heart and what he wants to achieve. And that's why the bride is the new Jerusalem previewed, revealed beforehand, because he chooses the bride to be wife and she reflects the future home of what he wants his home to be. So there is a glory of the man which is reflective of the Father. And then you have the woman who is the glory of the man. And now, in this chain of glory, it's, it's not that it drops off. This is the, the man is in the image of God, and therefore he represents the glory of God. But now the woman is the glory of the husband. And so, in that image, I want to ask you, what about the children that are the product of that union? If the man is the glory of God, and the woman is the glory of the man, there has to be some... A equals B equals C, A equals C going on there somehow, right? Just in the, in, in, there has to be some continuity of what the woman is represented when she represents the character of a man. So if this is true of the man and the woman, what about the children? What about the whole? As I, I think the saying is, and there's tremendous debate as to where it originates, but the, the whole is not just the sum of the parts. That there's something greater that comes out of when the, the, when the parts come together. That you can't just look at, you can't just look at all the ingredients of bread and say, well, there they are, they, they, they make bread. But once it comes together in the right way, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. I know I've kind of ventured into philosophy and some of you are either really liking it or you're wincing. But I want you to ponder that in a family. You take a man, all right? You got the man, you got the woman. Okay, you got the woman. And you got the children. Okay, you've got them. Well, you've got them. Let's just put them together and add them together. Well, no, that's not quite going to be enough. What about when they're, when they're together? When they, when they're, they become whole? And, and it's, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It's something that is, God wants to reflect. The man, maybe he has a glory on his own, but the man, when he's joined to the woman... There's some multiplication of that glory because now the woman is the glory of the man. I'm I'm saying, then what about the children? In Psalms 127, verses 3 to 5, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. This is what uh, children are. They're an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Now, that's why I have a saying you can't lose when you have kids. I've been asked the question before, do you know if you're having a boy or a girl? And I'm like, yeah. Is there a third option? Yeah, we're having a boy or a girl. And they don't necessarily appreciate my sarcasm. But either way, you can't lose. Boy or girl, you can't lose. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth, of youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. That's five, Brother Travis. Five. Five, not three. Five. Happy is the man that has his quiver full. They shall not be ashamed. But they, the children, speak with the enemies in the gate. A man who has five children, uh, and I believe that a quiver would be five. So a man who has many children, his quiver full. He's got these children of strength and vitality. He will, 
Uh, they will not be ashamed, nor will the parent be ashamed, but he has defenders, protectors, those that will, will stand together shoulder to shoulder to speak against the enemies in the gate. And so the word of God is validating this sense of the preciousness and the value of children. Children are a heritage, an inheritance given to you. If you, have, if you know someone that has children, if you're one that has children yourself, then there's, a, there's an acknowledgement to God. I say saved or unsaved. There's an acknowledgement to God that children are a gift from God. Amen. And there's so much that could be said in that vein. But consider then the glory that our children represent. Do we fully appreciate and, and recognize the value of their worth. I don't ask that in a rhetorical manner that you don't. I'm just asking, do you feel that you do? Brother Branham, in the message, it wasn't so from the beginning. It's the first place I found where he's making this direct statement. But he says that a brother said, two omnipotence mean. He said, I have to write that down. Or the way that he references it, it's like he had heard it. And he says, he says two omnipotence mean. I wrote that down. He says, when God and a believer meets, there's two omnipotents. So God and a believer. A believer is an omnipotent. God is an omnipotent. Because a man is a part of God. He is a son of God. And what little he is joins with the entire body. So in a couple other places where he references two omnipotents meeting, he says something's got to shake. He talks about how it creates a power. Why? Because God is an omnipotent and a believer is an omnipotent. Now, I'm wanting you to think now as spiritual minded sons and daughters of God then, that if I'm a son of God, and I marry a daughter of God, and if me as a son of God meeting God is too omnipotent meeting because I'm a part of God, then there must be something on some level somehow of an omnipotent joining together with an omnipotent when a believing man and a believing woman come together. You begin to recognize how there may be a higher order to not being unequally yoked. It may not be because your soul will be sent to hell, but just think about the power that is resident in a family when a believing man and a believing woman are joined together in holy matrimony. There's two omnipotents meeting in a promise. He says it'll shake something. Something's got to shake. It creates a power. And think of all the instances where Jesus says two or three, two or three, two or three. And he even says if two will agree as to touching anything. Why? It's, it's those omnipotents meeting. What does it say in Mark chapter 10, verses 6 to 9? I'll just skip to verse 9. Is it saying the two shall be one flesh when a man shall leave his father and mother? In the beginning, God created them male and female. And when a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, there'll be one flesh, not no more two, but one flesh. Verse 9, what therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Two omnipotents being joined together under a covenant. Marriage is in the covenant. Parenthood is joined with the covenant. And I say children, as that was my proposition, children are the glory of the family. I would say that children may often be the unrecognized or the hidden glory of this union of God. Because in, there's in, the, in Timothy, it talks about how the woman shall be saved in childbearing. Brother Branham, if she continues in, the, in these things, he makes a statement in marriage and divorce. It's very unique. And he says, and remember, she being a part of a man, the Bible said, she nevertheless has suffered not a woman to teach or to usurp authority, any authority but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the byproduct was deceived. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved as she continues in holiness and sobriety and in childbearing and all such, because then she becomes a part of this man. You notice that? Because then she becomes a part of this man. There is this, this recognition in two instances in the Word of God where Brother Branham kind of uses this to make the point, not that there was some uh, maybe literal, uh, some way that God had the option, but he uses this to make the point that when Adam took the woman and she was hold, bearing, holding his son, that God couldn't judge her because a part of the man was in her. And then when it came to Sarah, he uses a, a very interesting Take on it that when Sarah laughs, God couldn't judge her because she was going to be the one through whom the promise came. So she's joined, she's joined with the man and therefore she's part of the covenant. But then once conception and birth takes place, it's in the child that they've truly, literally become one flesh. 
It's like people, I've said this a lot with my wife. They say, well, uh, who do you think? I think maybe I've asked the question, who do you think your children are going to look like? Or what are your children going to look like? I said, they're going to look like what children will look like if Aaron and Elizabeth have a child. And, oh, he looks like his dad. Yeah, because that's his dad. Oh, he looks like his mom. Yeah, because that's his mom, right? It's a mixture. It's a blending together. There has actually now been a union. And even this natural birth, God gets the credit for it. Even Brother Matt said the natural birth is more supernatural. And you kind of figure that out. But in that way that God brings this life together and this life comes forth. And in looking at this life, that is in that there has been a union of the DNA. There has been a joining together of father gene and mother genes coming together and recreating and producing that child. And Brother Ram makes this statement that through childbearing, then she becomes what? An indivisible part of the man. Forever joined together with the man because now there's a product of their union that is the man and the woman now joined and being reflected out. And he said, then she becomes a part of the man. What God hath joined together, it cannot be divided in that child. And I'm just saying to you with a very heavy heart that we must be thinking very spiritually, very deeply, very maturely about these things. These are not things that are the property of Dr. Dobson. These are not the things that are the properties of men and their psychologies and their approach to families. This is something divine. This is something precious. This is something that we've got to get right before we get out of here. Because it's, it's the glory of the union. Even to use the language that at the opening of the seals, the full word is going to be born into manifestation. Implies that the product of the union is the glory of the union. In Proverbs 22, 6, we're coming back to this. I'm not just starting over in my notes because it's only 8.13. I'm coming back to it. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Initiate the child at the opening of his path. Inspire him. Motivate him at the opening of his path. Remember, his path, his way, her way, her path. If I could say this, and I hope that you can ponder this very deeply now and, and, and concentrate, that in the natural, there are hundreds of successful paths. I know Brother Lucas might want us to think that all we should ever be are programmers, but we all can't be programmers. Otherwise, you programmers would have nobody to program for and you get paid eight bucks an hour. But uh, that's, not, that's not just an argument to Brother Lucas. But we can't all do that, right? And, and to that point, Brother Lucas has a process to kind of find those who can be programmers. Because not everybody can program. It's not everyone can cook, right? This isn't a Disney movie or whatever that was. There's things that some people are better predisposed to. There's things that people enjoy and they like. And even within the, 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 the world of coding, and I'm getting way outside of my uh, expertise, is there's many different paths within that that you can be. And some are better suited for different things. And this is, I want you to consider this, that when it comes to natural things, there's a lot of successful paths you can take. Oh, this person is in this line of work, and this person does this, and this person does that, and this person got their degree, and this person got this trade certificate, and this person does this, this person owns this business. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different jobs that we could have and calls that we have, and in that be successful. And I want you to think of how remarkable this is. We can have different ethnicities, different cultural backgrounds, different social economic statuses. We can all have different jobs, and we can all have so many varieties of tastes and likes and desires and inclinations. And all of that be, be successful and be fine and be, uh, and be good. But when it comes to the word of God, we all take the same path. Uh, now just scratch your head on that for a while. Think about that. That God designed a word so beautiful and so perfect that it can take people from different ethnicities, cultures. Ex we all have different experiences, different backgrounds, things that we've gone through, losses, hurts, things that we've gained and been added to us. But yet the word of God could somehow on some level be applicable to all of us. And though there may be thousands of ways that we could be successfully naturally, there's only one path we can take and be successful spiritually. And so when it comes to the path that we should go, we're initiating the opening of the child's path, 
we need to consider how much that relates to the spiritual part and not so much the natural part. You train him up in the way that he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. There is a spiritual success that we ought to desire for our children. This is the one I believe that I'm probably the most, uh, I'm the most fervent of tonight as I speak this, is it's a recognition of the value that our children hold. In Proverbs chapter 19, verses 26 to 27, He that wasteth his father and chaseth away his mother is a son that causeth shame, and bringeth reproach. These are very heavy words. Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth to err from the words of knowledge. Now, this is obviously pointed at the child, right? Just by clear language, he that wastes his father and chases his mother causes shame and brings reproach. So, son, stop listening to the things that cause you to err from the words of knowledge. So then what is our responsibility? Our responsibility is that we are giving the correct law, the correct knowledge, the the, the rule, the wisdom of the father, the law of the mother. We have to recognize our responsibility that's already assumed in this. This is a presupposition to this, that he that wasteth his father and chases his mother causes shame and bringeth reproach when what they have brought him to is the words of knowledge. To waste is to spoil what has been given. The Bible is saying that he robs and insults those he ought to honor when they have initiated him in the right path, when they had given him the right spiritual instruction, when they've looked out over his spirit, and despite all the nature that they gave him by natural birth, they nurtured him in the Holy Spirit and nurtured him in the admonition of the Lord, and they, uh, and they used that Holy Spirit to work against their base instincts and, and used it to apologize when necessary, used it to moderate when necessary, used it to guide their child's heart while they had the opportunity to keep that garden clean. It says a child that then wastes his father and chases away his mother, that causes shame and brings reproach but the power to waste and chase only existed because of the power to raise and praise he would only have power to waste and chase if by the virtue by the opposite he had power to raise them up by he had the power then to praise his parents to be to be a legacy, something that spoke of their legacy, something to be cherished, something to be honored, just as the woman is a crown to her husband, but he, she that maketh the shame is rottenness in his bones. She only has power to corrupt because she has the power to crown. Children only have the power to waste and chase because they have a power then to be the glory and an expression of something very beautiful in the parental union. I say it this way, there's glory in our children. Something that we have a duty to bring out of them. That's why I came with the idea of digging for gold. I'll be honest, I asked a couple of brothers how the title Gold Digger sounded, and they cautioned me. In my innocence, I might not know exactly what that phrase means, so I just uh, took their advice and backed out. But that's what we're doing as parents. It may not look like it, but that bag of dirt sitting next to you, it's got gold in it. Right? There's gold in in those children that God has given us. Brother Branham says in the message, come follow me. And I I, I want you now to ponder this as I, I, I can't read the entirety of the statement. But he's praying. He says, let us pray And he says, Lord Jesus, youth, men and women for tomorrow, if there is a tomorrow, we must train them, Lord. We feel that burden to train them like there will be a tomorrow. If if we get so uh, spiritual, super spiritual, to where we think, well, What's the point? You know, the, the Lord's already come or the Lord's coming tomorrow. What's the point? That you, you're, not, you're just not listening to the word. We have a burden to train them as if there would be a tomorrow. Why do we have a burden to train them as if there would be a tomorrow? Because that's our duty today. And in, the fa- and in failing to perform our duty, it only would delay 
the inevitable that we're choose, using as a reason to delay. You follow me? Well, I don't have to raise my kids because the Lord's coming tomorrow. The Lord's like saying, if you don't raise your kids, I ain't coming tomorrow. Just using your language. It's incumbent upon us. Why is there a language? They're waiting on us. They're depending on us. Why is there have to be some liberty of the Holy Spirit to move through us so freely that it replicates the image of Christ and it touches all that have gone into the grave and we go in the rapture because we have a duty that we must fulfill and will never fulfill it unless our eyes are awakened to see the gold that sits in the chairs next to us tonight. Oh, would it strike the heart of a mother or father to see the gold right now sitting in their rooms out doing something else. The gold that is out in the world today that could be in the house of God tonight. And you say, well, okay, Brother Aaron. Where's, where's the, where in the world do you get digging for gold in this? Just personally, I say there's a way that God confirms things to me. And I know that I found the, the channel. And I think every man of God has a different way of knowing that they've, they, they've come to that mind of God. But I have such an absolute confidence that I found the mind of God that I cannot waver on what I'm saying tonight. And in this, where he says, we must train them. This thought just kept coming to me over and over. We must train them. We have a duty to train them like there will be tomorrow. So I went back and I was reading the message, come follow me. And Brother Branham, and I took the paragraph numbers out when I grabbed the quote here. I don't have it because it's very lengthy. He says, can we pray? And this is what he says. We have a duty to train them like there would be a tomorrow. But right before he prays, he tells two stories. And the first story he tells is this fairy tale story of a man who found a flower. And he found the flower and he's going to provide some magic. And he says, you've been poor your whole life. Now ask what you want and I'll give it to you. And the man says, yonder there, there's a mountain yonder. If it would open up, I could go therein and find the gold in the mountain." But the prerequisite was, okay, you have to take me with you everywhere you go. You have to take me with you wherever I am. Then you can ask what you will. He goes to the mountain, and the mountain opens up, and he goes in. He says, Brother Man says, shells full of gold and diamond. This, this flower, this magical flower opened up to him, this, this mountain of gold and diamonds. And he put the, uh, the flower down on a rock or a table. And he says, now nah, I'm a rich man. I have everything I need. And he says, and, and he I think he says he's going to run to go out and he wants to uh, grab something to go out and show all of his friends. And the flower says, you forgot the main thing. So he runs back, I'll get a piece of gold, I'll get a piece of silver. And the flower says, but you forgot the main thing. He runs back and says, in here we find all kinds of materials. So he picked up a stone, he grabbed all these things. Oh, I'm going to be able to show the people and show the people. He said, for the final time, you forgot the main thing. And he turns and oh, be quiet. I don't want to hear anymore forgot the main thing, ran out the door, and the door closed behind him with the flower inside, and he had no way to get back to the gold. Why? Because he forgot the main thing. He forgot his access to those materials. He forgot his, what brings him to that. And then immediately he says, years ago, when I was, I, I, as a kid on a cattle ranch in Phoenix, he said, I was reading a piece of uh, a paper about a prospector. And he said the prospector had come had found a, struck a lot of gold. And he said that when he had got the gold, there an outlaw that had been following and knew that he had this gold. And so he was pondering, oh, I can, get, I can become a rich man. I've struck gold. I've got all the gold here, so much of it. And as he was trying to go to sleep, a dog kept barking. And as it kept barking and barking, he told it to be quiet, screamed at the dog, be quiet. Dog whined, tried to warn his master. The danger was lurking. Why, this outlaw is there. And the dog is trying to warn him of the one that's going to take his gold. And he says that he took the prospector, had a shotgun, didn't want to be bothered anymore, and he killed the dog. But then the prospector was killed that night by the outlaw. I know a lot of you are familiar with the story, right? He tells the story about gold. Right before he says, I have a burden I have a burden to train these young people. I have a burden to train these young men and women at this point in their life. And he said, there's nobody. He makes this statement. He said, all his fancy dreams did him no good. He stilled the voice that was warning him. He says, there's nobody can try to do anything, you kids. You would never be able to do anything wrong after being raised the way you are unless you feel something tell you not to do it. Now don't ever steal that voice that's warning you. So he says, come follow me. 
This is the, this is the emphasis Brother Branham is, this is the image that Brother Branham has right before he brings us to this statement. We must train them, Lord. We must train them. Like there's going to be a morrow, tomorrow. We feel the burden to do it. Now, I, I'm, I feel like I'm taking the liberty. I, I feel the liberty to take the liberty. So, give me, I, so I hope you have liberty to hear me take the liberty with the liberty that I feel like taking. Because in the burden to train, I want you to recognize that it has something to do with the gold. It has something to do with what's valuable. It has something to do with the deity that God wants to join in our children's hearts. It has something to do with the character that can be mined out of the flesh that sits before us. And there might be things about our children that we don't like. There might be things that we do like. But if you can ever get past the facade, if you can ever get past the, the flesh, if you can ever get past that, that, that what meets the eye and recognize that down inside of them is a soul that is very precious to God and that has value and has merit, then, then I believe you can have inspiration. I believe you can have motivation. I believe you can recognize that you are a very wealthy person if given the responsibility to look after and to care for a son and daughter's soul and have this burden to train them and to say, oh God, may, may I not be guilty of the man who left the main thing behind. May I not be guilty of quieting that voice that warns me, but God, may I also instill in my children to recognize that beyond all the material things, beyond all the blessings, beyond the natural things they see in my life that you've given, because you have to realize, saints, that many times it's just the tangible things that our children most readily identify as being the blessings of God, but we have to find some way to let them know about the joy that's on the deep part of your soul that resides sun or shot like wind or rain lord that is there all the time there has to be a way to convey to them a steadiness and integrity and honesty and uprightness and that they can begin to value the main thing and the voice that preserves us brother branham makes this statement in the message in absolute He says, I see the word is the absolute, and I'm tied to it. I'm determined I'll know nothing else but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, Brother Brown speaks very personally, but I believe that it has application to all of us. And applications to the children of God as we would view them. But Lucas, even think about what we fellowshiped on just briefly today. Think about how he says this. No matter what anybody, he says, he had a reason for it, and I'm determined to hold that reason. No matter what anybody else says, I don't disfellowship them or discredit them, but I know what I'm tied to. He wanted me like this. He made me like this. I was made like that for a purpose. I had to be made up of all these qualities and so forth. Think about how often we try to force people to fit our way and our whole purpose, either it's a church that gets misguided or parents that get misguided or whatever it might be. We think to train up a child in the way he should go is to beat him into submission of the image that we think they should be instead of promoting an experience with Jesus Christ that'll make them into the son or daughter that he wants them to be. But he says, I was made up of all these qualities and so forth and all these no accounts so he could dig it out of me. Now, there's... That you might think, oh, he's got to root it out and get it out. But I don't read it as something he wanted to get out in order to make you better. But to get it out because there's something valuable in there. He says, put something in there. That was his word. There's something, I can say this, there's something that maybe we can say God takes away. But it's because there's something else in there that's more valuable that detracts from the value. And he wants to bring out of you the gold. Why? Because he put something in you by birth. From the very time you're born, there's an elect seed there. He says his word. And I'm determined I'll know nothing else but Christ. I realize we could read these things different ways, but I want to look at, just turn it on a, a different angle. That God wants to dig the gold out of you. He puts something in there, his word. And he wants to bring it out of you. 
Maybe there's a lot of things that get in the way and cover it up. He says, but I'm determined on nothing else but Christ. If our musicians could make their way to their instruments. I closed. I'm determined to know nothing else but Christ. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever I eat, whatever I drink, whatever I do, do all to the glory of God. This is our ambition as Christians. Therefore, we should inspire our children to pursue the glory of God. We should inspire them to, to pursue it by our example and by our instruction. Because whatsoever we do, we do for the glory of God. You could ask yourself in times of difficult decisions, what gives God glory? What, what can I do to give glory to God? We may feel there's times that we have to preserve our particular position on something. We might feel that there's a moment where we, we want something to be made very clear. Like, wow, this person did this, and I don't want anybody to know that, and I, I think I should do this, and there's a lot of, a lot of things that kind of get in the way and muddy it up. But if you take a step back and say, what will give God the glory? You'll find that there's a better decision in that. Because we're not always just defenders of what's right. Am I right? Now, where sometimes we go wrong because we're, we're just these justice warriors and we, we, we want to demand justice. We want, we want equity. We want what's fair. We want what's constitutionally right. But even on that, people can't agree. So we have to ask ourselves, what gives glory to God? In that instance where a man lied about Brother Branham and said, Brother Branham's not here. He can't make it. He got called away. Brother Branham's just off the side of the platform sitting there. And he said, he's told, why don't you go out there and expose this man? He's, he's lying. And he goes, oh, brother, I, I can't do that. Not in front of his people. Now you think, you might think, well, that man deserved it. Amen. All right. I mean, we all know what we would have done. We would have been coming out there, you know, doing a dance. Like, hello. You know, here I am. We would have exposed the man. And he said, that may be what the man was. He's a liar. That may be what that man needed. He, he's lying. But what would have glorified God? Brother Branham acted with a metric. He acted with some, with a, a compass. So he was very sensitive to what would glorify God. And is that not how Christ, as the Son, he only did that which would glorify the Father? He did that which would please the Father? Therefore, we as parents have a, have a, a resource in our children. And what we ought to be doing in our own lives is digging for gold. But what we recognize then in our children, that there's so much gold that we can, we can look over this resource and we say, Lord, help me. I, I desire to raise them so they can discover gold. Let's stand. Let's pray together tonight. Father, as we draw the service to a close, in a natural way, Lord, the sermon has been delivered in the literal function of and the activity of the preaching. As Paul referred to it, that the world calls it foolishness. That, that has transpired, Lord. That, that part has been done. But I believe that that is furthering your vision, your purpose, your plan. So it's not that anything has been initiated tonight or begun. We're just working within the momentum of what you have already started. And Lord, certainly in preaching this, there is not a period that has been placed upon anything. But Lord, it will continue as the people are dismissed. My prayer would be that what was preached tonight would not only resonate as a good sermon, Lord, I wouldn't even 
need it to resonate as a good sermon. I would just that it would resonate in the hearts of your children as something that could be applied, something applicable, something mind uh, altering and mood altering, something that you know just moves the compass, Lord. And Father, I know in my heart there's maybe there's many that I would like to as a pastor to be here to hear these things feeling that these Wednesday nights give us an incredible opportunity to bring together a wonderful mix of believers and and capitalize on the atmosphere and the attentiveness and the expectation to do real teaching and to share on things that make are applicable where the rubber meets the road as it were and and to bring a transforming power to the lives of our children to relationships. But Lord, we trust you in all these things. And I would tonight that what we have ministered would hit the target for people. And I know that maybe I'm using clever phrases and, and things, Lord, that might seem to be ambiguous. But Lord, maybe you could speak to everyone differently on what it means that kids eat free. But Lord, I'm speaking to prospectors tonight. We have a job to do. We have a duty. And maybe we're not getting out of here till the last nugget is mine. So Lord, I busy myself in your kingdom. And I take responsibility for the, those that you've chosen for me to be responsible for. I, I, I own it, Lord. And I pray for your grace and for your help tonight. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, bless us, help us, I pray. Amen. Amen. I know these things are challenging. But a believer likes to be challenged.